the right on like the what? bottom webinar webinar we are we are all good we are all we are all in the webinar. webinar yes so we can go ahead and get started okay So uh, hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. My name is Leili Seifi, Associate Professor at the University of Birjan and current chair of SIGTRIPOLOI for the Association of Information Science Technology. Parya and I will be your host today. Uh, today's panel is a joint panel between ACES, SIGTRIPOLOI, IFLA New Professional SIG, and the University of North Texas ACES um, student chapter on how to land a job tips from search committee members. Uh, we have uh, two, yes. So before I introduce our uh, panelists, I will introduce our uh, first panelist, then Pario will introduce the second panelist. Uh, I'm just reading the privacy. Uh, this event is being recorded, uh, including uh, chat. Uh, the recording, uh, of course, uh, we will be posting on uh, new professional SIG and ACES SIG uh, uh, AAA publication page. Uh, microphones have been muted for this event, and questions, any questions, uh, should be typed into the Q and A chat box. Uh, so uh, I'm introducing uh, our first uh, speaker, uh, yeah, Dr. Naresh uh, Agrawal, professor and uh, director of uh, the Information Science and Technology Concentration at the School of Library and Information Science, Simmons uh, University, Boston, USA a past president of ACES and founder of its South Asia chapter. He received his PhD from the National University of Singapore. Uh, his research area is information behavior and knowledge management. Knowledge has authored two books, Exploring Context in Information Behavior and Engineering to EQI. Uh, you know the glory, not the story. He is currently co-authoring a book on knowledge management in libraries. He has been a keynote invited speaker in several countries. Naresh has been a part of several search committees. Uh, for many years, he moderated and participated in a very popular panel organized by ACES, a SIG ED uh, on finding jobs in the academic job market. In his talk, Naresh will provide practical tips and insight for PhD students and others seeking to uh, enter academia as a faculty member. So we are so glad uh, to have uh, uh, Dr. Agrawal at uh, this uh, panel. Uh, without a further uh, ado, uh, Dr. Agrawal, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, uh, Lily. And uh, it's wonderful to the, to be a part of like uh, Derek and Periad here and uh, along with Lily and as well as uh, all of you as uh, participants. So uh, coming straight to the topic. So basically, I think uh, if you are participating in this, uh, you're probably interested in, in some tips or are in advice on how to land a job. Right. And I think we are covering uh, different uh, institutions. So I'll be talking mostly in the academic job market and then Derek will be taking that further in, in another setting. And so when you think of a job, right? Um, well, firstly, uh, I know that when you are going through the process, it's a very stressful process, right? And now um, being uh, being on the other side is easy, but when, but when you are there, there is some level of anxiety uh, when, you, when you're applying for a job and trying to look for a job. Um, having said that, um, it's also important to, re to re remember that even when you're looking for a job, right? That those are uh, days of your life. Uh, time that you are uh, living. So if you decide uh, to live that days, uh, live those days in anxiety, then you're actually doing yourself a disservice. So typically what I tell people is that uh, uh, whenever you are in, in, in uh, looking for a job, then give yourself uh, five days a week, that's Mondays to Fridays, and the first hour of the day, uh, which is, uh, let's say, from uh, 9 to 10 a.m. or something. So that's a time when you can uh, 
work on your CV or apply for positions or follow up in positions and all that. And then not worry about the rest of the day and not worry about it in the weekend. So that way, you know that you're doing something about it and you're doing it early in the morning, but you're not spending your days in anxiety because uh, that's that's a constant part of the process that you're working on because uh, it, it does take time. Uh, when you apply for positions, uh, it is a time-consuming process which can take from uh, a few months to one or two years and so on, right? And you have to constantly uh, keep at it. So when you, when you go for a PhD, the, uh, I'm assuming that when you're thinking of a job in academia that you would have a PhD, right? And after your PhD, or even when you finish, uh, even before you finish your PhD, when you start looking for jobs, now that's the time that that you start applying. So what I had done was that I was I did my PhD from the National University of Singapore, and uh, my wife was doing her medical residency in New York at that time. So I moved here, and then I was trying to apply for jobs. And uh, I must have sent, I don't know, 200, 300 uh, applications. Uh, so that wherever I, I would find advertisements, I would write long emails to uh, to professors and to schools. And I'd attach my CV, I'd attach uh, a cover letter, and I'd attach a, a teaching statement and sometimes a research statement, depending on what they were looking for. And uh, so I had those uh, pieces in there. Now, um, in your case, uh, uh, so, so that's one thing. But then... Um, Whenever you're looking for an area, typically in the job applications, they will say that we are looking for positions in these and these uh, uh, areas. So, so by the way, uh, uh, Simmons University School of Library and Information Science uh, is looking to fill positions, especially in the areas of information science and technology. And I happen to be uh, the chair of that search committee. So, so that is there. If you are interested, you can actually send me your materials. And, and Simmons, uh, Simmons School of Library and Information Science is looking for uh, applications right now. So that is just an aside. Uh, but yeah, so to be, there's a job description in which you write the kind of areas that a university is looking for. They'll say, okay, we are looking to fill an area, let's say, in usability or knowledge management or, uh, or, or let's say, databases or any, anything that, any topic that uh, a university typically has a need. And uh, the way it works is that uh, what, what, what people list at that point in time is not something which they know for sure, because uh, sometimes what happens is that a faculty member leaves, and then you have to fill the area which the faculty member was teaching or doing beforehand. But that also provides the university with a new opportunity to create something new, to fill gaps in which they might not have thought about before. So they will typically, uh, universities will typically try to put in a few areas over there, and uh, there might be a list of five or six areas, but they don't expect you to have all those areas in one single person. So you don't really have to need to check all those boxes. And sometimes if you bring something extra, then that's something which the university cannot anticipate beforehand. So they're looking for the right candidate. So don't uh, hesitate to apply and just tell them what you what you bring in. And if there is a fit, uh, there will be an opportunity for, for you and the university to then uh, then work together. Yeah. So so yeah, and so the first time I applied, I, there were lots of positions and then, uh, but people told me that conferences are the best place to, to look for jobs uh, in academia. So I traveled to different conferences. I traveled to Elise, I traveled to ASIST. I also traveled to one or two other conferences. And I remember, I think at uh, uh, at ASIST, I had 14 interviews in 2008 in Columbus, Ohio. Then at uh, Elise, I had some 17 interviews. So these were these were small screening interviews with faculty who were already there at the conference. So, so that was uh, one thing, but, and then, but these interviews are not final. So based on that, if they like you, they might invite you to campus. Uh, if they if they shortlist you, um, and then if you get invited, that's when you have uh, one or two days of entire days of interviews with pretty much all the faculty members and staff, and you also have a, have to give a public talk uh, uh, to the students uh, at the point. So I'm going to show you a few uh, materials, and uh, so this is my uh, uh, my CV. I just updated it uh, on August first. Now, now typically. Uh, uh, when you're applying as a uh, freshly in academia, you might not have a very long CV. That doesn't really matter. But uh, what I'm trying to show you is the kind of uh, topics or the headings which are there uh, or which should be there ideally. So typically, you'll have one heading on your education uh, that way uh, that what are you studying and, and where. And you'll typically write maybe a dissertation topic or when is the expected date of graduation. If you have uh, all but uh, data, then you then you write that. So you'd say the state that you're in, and then you'll also write uh, any past employment that you that you have had. 
and uh, then you'll have a, a place for your publications on your CV. Now, you can put the, the things uh, which are there. Uh, so ideally, a CV should only have things which are published. And you can also have things which are accepted. But when you have um, revise and resubmit kind of a thing, so that's not really uh, an acceptance uh, at that point. But I think initially for your first job, you could still write that. But what I tend to do is that I create a separate uh, document. And this is called like a manuscripts in progress kind of a document. So in this, it's kind of an addendum to the CV. So if I have anything under review or anything in, in, in preparation and so on, um, I will write those kinds of things uh, in, in this separate addition to the CV. So I call this like a manuscripts in progress. Uh, but in your in your main CV, uh, you can have your, your publications. And typically, um, it's also useful to, write, to mention for each publication uh, what is the, the... Let me just go down actually to in this. So this is employment. Uh, so here your publication. So I have refereed journal articles. So refereed is is peer reviewed, right? And uh, so it, it's good to it's a good practice to provide the page numbers whenever available, right? Page hundred and five to one to do what? So which are page numbers? And if you if the page number is not there, then you can just write uh, twenty pages or five pages or something like whatever pages are there, so people can see that it's a full paper. Uh, in this case, I've also put an asterisk for any, any publications that I did with students. Uh, in your case, that would not apply right away, I think, as if because you would be a student applying for jobs. Okay. And if there are any invited articles or articles in conference proceedings, then you put that in a separate uh, heading. Um, again, initially, you, you might have, uh, in uh, more than books, you might have uh, uh, book chapters, uh, one or two that uh, at that the stage, then, then you could uh, mention those as well. And uh, what I've separated is a category of short papers and posters, because these are not full length papers. These are either two or four page papers. So I've put those uh, separately here. And uh, abstracts, again, one, only abstracts were there, like well, just one paragraph uh, was accepted for these. Uh, okay, and if there are any panels that you have been a part of, you can write that as well, uh, that these are like, and if they were peer reviewed, you put them as refereed panels. And, uh, and if there are invited panels, you, you put them separately. The these are invited, like this is not uh, peer reviewed. Okay. And uh, and if there are any other other kinds of publications like blog posts or anything other which is not really academic, you can put them as uh, professional publications, or other kinds of publications. So I have those in poems and other kinds of things, but popular publications and all. You can put them. And then if you have any awards, you list them uh, under that. Uh, and in separate, you need to have awards category. Uh, citations, uh, I have put it right now. Initially, it depends on the citations you have. If you have uh, citations to begin with, you can add that or you can leave this out. And if you have any research grants, uh, travel grants and so on, you can mention those. Okay. And uh, and if you have done any any talks or workshops, uh, uh, you, you can uh, do the, you can you can have a column for that. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, heading for that. So these are all the, I just have them for talks and workshops and so on. I've separated the talks, which are the more external and more department based. But but the basic heading is is your publications. Uh, uh, that's, that's the important piece to have. And uh, so what happens in academia is that you, you have three kinds of roles. You have, uh, you expect it to teach, and you expect it to have service and you expect it to have research. So typically when you are joining academia for the first time, uh, what they look for is teaching experience. So if you have done, if you've been a teaching assistant and you, or, or if you have taught any courses or assisted a professor in teaching a course, then you can mention that. In this case, I mentioned service. So if you've done any leadership roles in any association or otherwise, you can have a, that service part. Okay, so in this case, I've separated between the school service and then university or college-based service and then um, professional service like at ASIST and so on. Yes. Um, and then if you've done any evaluation work, like, like reviewing things, if you've been a reviewer, then you can mention that, uh, which which uh, which uh, journals and all you've reviewed for. Yes. So those kinds of things you can mention in, in, a, in a, separate cat a separate heading. Um, yeah, the, this is where the reviewing, being a, if you're a member of an editorial board or if you have done any part of a program committee or just uh, been a reviewer for different things, 
then this is the place that you can uh, mention. Like, yeah, I've mentioned all the journals that I've reviewed for in the years when I did that. Okay. And this this is the extra things like languages you speak and any other accomplishments you want to put in or any associations that you're a part of. So that's uh, a CV. It doesn't need to be very long, but it, but it, it needs to have the, uh, the separate uh, different sections. And it should be clear. There should be no misrepresentation. And if there, if you're unsure of anything, like just specify something uh, in there, and always get your CV CV vetted by by different people uh, before you send it out. Okay, and your cover letter can be more personalized, where you mention uh, that your different research areas or things that you teach, uh, and the, and so on. So I do have like a research area section there. That's also typically that uh, people like having. I think so. In this case, I have like this. Yeah, the research areas are here: information, behavior, knowledge management. And teaching areas, of the places like kind of the things that you have taught or can teach. Okay, so that's about the CV. Then some people look for um, a teaching statement. So in this case, I um, this was part of my from my tenure dossier, and I had done this reflection on teaching philosophy, approach, and strategies. So this is a kind of a teaching statement as well. So here I've talked about like how I gather feedback from my classes, uh, how I use a uh, backward design approach uh, i the kind of the way i assign readings uh, how do i use the, how do i structure the in class time well, how what do i do in a face to face class what do i do in an online class if you have experience with online teaching you might want to mention that and how do i structure in class discussions uh, how do i design assignments and how do i remember the names of students what kind of te of teaching tools that i use and all of that and this in this case i also included a little analysis of changes i made every time based on uh, from semester to semester. So helping students develop a hunger to learn. So this was a part of the teaching philosophy, understanding my students, setting clear expectations, uh, pre uh, pre preparing well, knowing my stuff, uh, communicating effectively and encouraging collaborative learning or learning from peers, providing regular feedback and being approachable, uh, being organized, flexible and creative and having a passion for teaching and constantly seeking to improve. So this was uh, based upon my philosophy or approach to teaching, and you might have your own, right? But typically, uh, it's good to show like uh, active learning strategies that you might use in a classroom, and why would you, why would you want to be a teacher or a professor? So those kinds of things that you have to articulate. So it's, it ha it has to be personalized to your own, but I just wanted to show mine just so that you get some idea about a uh, teaching statement. And then um, there is also the a personal narrative or, or a research statement. So this is again from my uh, tenure time. Um, so in this case, I I have, this is from 2014, I think, yeah. So this was 10 years old, but in this case, first time of the first part I've written about the teaching related aspects. Uh, but then uh, I have, and uh, yeah, I, I've also put it, put the teaching scores and all that I had from there. Then for research and scholarship. So that's where you mentioned your, your research in, research area. And uh, if you have any kind of a diagrammatic figure to show your research, you could uh, list that. And then uh, I talk about like what motivates my research, what are the kinds of research that I do and uh, any publications that came out of it, I can describe that. So those are the things uh, that you write in, in describing your, your research. So you have talked about different approaches, user and system-based, theoretical, empirical, task-based, everyday life, positivist, interpretivist, and so on. Yeah, so then yeah, any research goals for the future. So this was, uh, and then I have something for the service as well in a similar manner. So this was for my tenure. And later on, when I went for a full professor, I had a similar uh, dossier and in which, I, again, I had a, a personal statement here. And uh, in this case, uh, So this is in 2021. So I talk about how research, teaching, and service are all aligned and inform each other. Again, I, I talk about the reflection and performance in teaching and, uh, and then teaching score, the, the scores and so on. And then I talk about my research areas again in this. Uh, I describe the research areas. Uh, I describe each area in detail and then uh, what scholarship, what, what work that I've published and what's the impact of that has been over time and what kind of talks that I've done, any grants that I've gotten and what are my, what are my future plans related to research. Again, this is about service. So I think uh, that's about uh, based on the materials that I wanted to show and I could talk more about uh, 
what happens in interviews, how to prepare and all those uh, uh, questions and so on. But I think I will let uh, Derek speak and then maybe then we could uh, take more questions, I think, overall. Well, um, thanks, Narish, for your presentation. It was, I especially the parts where you were talking about the tips, how to avoid anxiety, because applying for jobs, it's it it can it it's stressful. So those tips are very helpful. Thanks for sharing and also for showing your CV and your you know um, statement, teaching statement. Those are very helpful, and you already have someone in the chat thanking you for sharing those. So. Um, we will, if you have any questions that you would like to ask our speakers, please either put it in the chat or put it in Q&A. And at the end of the um, presentations, we will get to Q&A and you have time to ask your questions from our speakers. So I will move on to Derek and I will introduce Derek first and then um, we can, let me share my screen first though, so I can have, ah. Uh, Okay, sorry, just a second, I'm trying to get things on. <laughs> you would think after uh, COVID with all of those things, we would be comfortable with these, but there we go. Okay, here, I have everything, I'm good. All right, so our next speaker is Derek Holling. Derek is an associate university librarian of Research and Digital Scholarship at Texas A&M University Libraries with a diverse career that includes sales, IT, librarianship, and leadership. Derek has been at the Texas A&M University Libraries for 23 years in various lead leadership roles. He has a track record of being an innovative thinker and his strategic <laughs> initiative have <laughs> propelled the university's research enterprise forward, positioning it as a hub for interdisciplinary collaboration and groundbreaking discoveries. Derek champions innovation, collaboration, and access in academia, shaping the future of research and scholarly communication. So Derek is going to speak about how you can get a job as a librarian. And I also wanted to mention that our speakers are sharing information about how things work in the US. So in international settings, it might be a little bit different. It's probably very similar, but there will be some things that will be a little bit different. So I wanted to mention that. And I will hand it over to Derek now. Thank you. Yeah. And and Paria, just one point on that is that like I have my picture on my CV and then that is something that's not very common in the US, but it's common in other countries. So yeah, those kinds of differences would be there. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Priya, for that mouthful of an introduction. I appreciate that. And, and thank you, Naresh. I learned a lot there, too. I appreciate that. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to see if I can share my screen and get right to a PowerPoint. So please let me know if you don't see this shortly, Priya. I think it should be there now. You're good, gonna, yeah. Okay, great. So as Priya said, uh, I've been at Texas A&M University Libraries in different capacities for about 23 years now. And the primary capacities I'm going to talk about isn't necessarily my organizational role as much as my role on various search committees. Uh, two particular things I'm going to focus on. And for those of you that don't know, uh, the academic libraries at Texas A&M up until a few years ago, librarians here were considered faculty, both tenure track and what's called APT, which is just academic uh, professional track. And then now, uh, since then, we have moved away from the faculty status and we're just considered staff, but still librarians uh, have a certain professional recognition. So we're going to talk a little about that in terms of being on search committees. So for six years, when we were considered faculty, I was the chair of the library search advisory committee. And so a little about that, you can see kind of I split this into columns, just very brief. It doesn't it's not all encompassing, but it kind of gives you the gist. And I'm showing you this now. Not all of it might seem like it's relevant, but as we go through some of the slides I'm going to show you, it might help you as you're applying for positions if you know uh, where you're applying, if, if if librarians are considered faculty or not, or if they're considered staff or not. It might help you customize your, your cover letter, your CV, towards more appropriate for the position you're applying for. 
there's something to consider. So when we were in the librarian faculty model, at that point, the dean, we had a library dean, and that person made all hiring decisions. So although we had a search committee, uh, unless the applicants were deemed unacceptable by that search committee, then all of them were up for consideration by the dean. And so uh, the applicants would come in, some would make the cut, some not based on how they applied. And we're going to look at what that means, making the cut or not. I'm going to show you some categories, how they're scored and things of that nature. Uh, the committee would look at them, measure strengths, weaknesses, and so on, create sort of a document for the dean that advises, yet does not recommend, uh, because the dean never wanted to be put in a situation to where maybe the committee recommends one person, but the dean decides on someone else. So uh, it was just listing basically strengths, weaknesses, and so on. Based on that, then we would we would perhaps state, you know, these would be good ones to investigate further, to bring in for in, for interviews. And then at that point, the dean would agree or disagree, and we would move forward. And we'll talk about that as we go. Uh, it was a larger search committee. There were about 10 members. And so that's important because, one, they were members from all over the library, not just, uh, let's say, we're hiring for a subject librarian. They weren't all just subject librarians on this committee. They were from all over the libraries. Even a couple of staff members, even though librarians were faculty, a few staff members, just to have a wide diversity of folks on the committee. That's important for multiple reasons. One, it helped us when we had interviews. There were multiple hands that help escort around. But it's important to you because what that means is there's people on this search committee that may not be familiar with the particular aspects of the position you're applying for. And we'll look at examples of that when there's a PD, maybe the PD is requesting experience in a certain area, but not all the committee members know the ins and outs of that. So if you say one thing that you just assume they know what that means, well, they might not. And so we'll look at that a little deeper. Um, back then, of course, because it was faculty positions, uh, oh, because there were 10 members, you see all scores averaged. All 10 members would score candidates that would all be averaged, and that would lead to a determination on who we wanted to invite in for further interviewing. Uh, research was scored then because it was faculty. So if you had publications, like Naresh was pointing earlier, if you, on your CV, if you had publications, presentations, chapters, books, committee, that's more service, service is scored. So committee membership, committee uh, leadership, uh, and we'll look at examples of that, what that can mean, what's the difference there. Um, also, because of its faculty nature, more committees were involved in the interviews than the, just the search committee. And what I mean by that is uh, when you're a faculty position, typically you start at assistant, move to associate, then to full. Um, if you're on tenure track, assistant does not have tenure, associate does. So if somebody was applying for a position to where they would ideally have or be eligible for tenure track, that overview committee would need to look at it and determine, hey, do they have what we would expect in terms of publication counts and impacts and so on to be considered for associate? If not, the highest we'd be able to offer them is assistant, or that's at their tenure track. If they were APT, which is that academic professional track, then it would be more based on service. You know, if it's assistant, are they members of a committee? Great. Uh, were they leadership? Oh, well, then maybe that's enough impact to merit an associate level and so on. So that's where that was one level. And we'll look at that because although we don't do that here anymore, some of you might be applying for positions that still do that. And so I just want you to kind of see at least how it worked here and that it might be relevant for where you're applying later. Currently, we're on the right side, the library and staff model. In this model, the committees aren't as big. The search committees before, remember we said it was about 10 members because they were doing all the reviews of all the faculty librarians being hired. Now it's more of a hiring manager. So the dean doesn't have to approve everything. The dean just signs off on it. The positions have already been approved. The hiring manager is the decision maker. What that means is we don't need a bunch of 10 person committees. We can just have a bunch of four person committees. And those committees are merely just as they say, advisory in nature. So it's not a group decision. It's people offering their opinion, offering their scores, what have you, but it's the hiring manager, manager's decision to extend an offer or not, or to bring people in for interview or not, and so on. In that case, there is only a single score listed. It's not, a, it's not an accumulation of scores. And I'll show you examples of that. And in that nature, since it's no longer faculty, 
And there is still usually a category for contribution to the profession, but it's not quite as important in many cases as it was previously. It's great if you have it, it's sort of like the icing on the cake. Okay, so let's maybe look at some examples of what I'm talking about. This would have been a very watered down basic PD. And in fact, it's very old. You can see it says lecture at the top. Our lecturers uh, migrated or evolved into what we're gonna call APT faculty positions at A&M libraries. Um, but this was a first year experience librarian, a very general, entry-level PD, you kind of see uh, responsibilities in the following areas. Uh, I can't see it because it's hidden by my Zoom bar at the top, but I think there's like general uh, description of what the librarian does at the top of the right side. I'm showing you this just to see, hey, it's asking for all these things. Great, I can speak to all this. Well, when you speak to it, this is where it becomes important for those of you that this was the faculty, APT faculty PD. I mentioned earlier, it's important to be specific in some cases. We had a search committee full of members that not all of them knew what all the ins and outs of every position was. So if it says, oh, let's see, let's look at that first bullet, works collaboratively with the first year experience team to provide instruction and outreach to early undergraduate students. If you have done that, be specific, say you have done that. Some of those search committee members, they're looking for apples to apples. They're not wanting to see you, well, I've done that, but you couch it in a different way. Get Sometimes these search committees, or even before them as a screening committee, it, they're, they're gatekeepers, right? First, get in the gate. Then you can expand on that and talk about different examples and, and ways you've used, or you can show experience in that area. So if it says measures instructional outcomes, say if you've done it don't don't be dishonest but if you've done it say i have measured instructional outcomes you know somehow and then you can add how you've done it later okay so i'll show you that as an example the reason i say that also is because i'll show you in this next screen typically whenever there's a pd we develop a rubric that goes behind it and so that rubric allows for points and weighting of those points in each of these categories. So you can see innovation. Now, I didn't pull necessarily the same PD to the same rubric, to the same matrix. I'm just showing you examples this so that you can see what's going on behind the screen, uh, behind the uh, screen, yeah. So you see the first category there, innovative, innovation. Hey, if you show evidence of innovativeness or innovation, there you go, you're gonna get one point. And that one point, you can see the weighting at the top, it's worth two. So for every one point you get in this category, it's gonna be a times two. So you can get up to six points total for this category. So we'll look at some examples later, but there might be examples where it says uh, knowledge of a something. Well, that just means you have to know about it, know it exists, know what we're talking about when we use the word. You're gonna get a point if you say you have knowledge of it. Experience with or demonstrates uh, aptitude with, those things are where you might want to embellish a little bit, not embellish, but but go into it a little bit more. Talk about more how you've done that thing, not just I know about it and I've actually used it on this project. Maybe you're a fresh grad, you haven't had a previous library position, but you've been in group projects or classes. Um, yeah, we implemented a this model and here's how we used it to successful outcome or successful theoretical conclusion. You can still speak to those things. So hopefully that makes sense and we can we can answer more on that as we go. So you have the rubric here. Behind the scenes, the search committee then takes the, the applications when you put in your application, your cover letter, your CV, which you should always, I think Naresh even mentioned this, always have the CV, always have a cover letter, always. Um, that cover letter, although in some circumstances, at least for librarian positions, I would recommend it not being more than a page to maybe a page and a half. Hit those points you need to hit to get past the gatekeepers. Make sure you're using those key terms and then talk more about when it asks for it, how you've done it. You see here, I'm sorry, I know it's a little blurry. I apologize about that, but about three bullets down, there's a perfect example. It says knowledge of biomedical databases. So you just talk about, yeah, I know about PubMed. Uh, uh, I've seen Medline and usage, and they taught us about cab abstracts in one of my classes. Demonstrated commitment. Well, there you might talk about how you've implemented some of those, those databases to an outcome. Experience with. 
uh, when were you tasked to do some searches to produce an outcome for, for a customer? Um, so that tells you, that gives you kind of some insight on when just mentioning a term is enough to get the point, when you might need to talk about it a little bit more to get those bonus points. Okay, and by bonus points, I'll go to the previous slide. You'll see there, like uh, on the right side, demonstrated evidence of effective engagement strategies for presentations to groups of all sizes. You mention it, you're going to get a point. You show evidence of applying innovative engagement strategies, you're getting another point. So that's what I mean by just talking about a little more. Okay. So each of those committee members takes your PD, takes the application, scores it according to the rubric, comes up with their points. In that model, when it's a whole search committee, all those points are added up and averaged. Typically, you look for a break points. So you can see the average score for these three applicants. I one was, let's see, at the bottom middle, sorry, again, it's blurry, 67. Next highest was 50, next one 48. There's typically, you look for gaps on these search committees. So they're looking for, um, hey, we have three applicants that all scored in maybe the upper 60s. Then it goes down to 50 for the next one. They, If those high 60s are enough to merit interviews, they're probably going to bring in those high 60s. Interview them first. The lower ones, they'll hold, see how it worked for the first ones, or maybe say, nope, that's too low. We're going to move on. And now too low. I want to stress there. That doesn't mean anyone wasn't good enough. It just might be, maybe they didn't talk more about the points where they were looking for it. Maybe they weren't as strong in some areas. So please don't take that as a, you're not good enough. You're perfectly fine. It's just perhaps what they're looking for, for this position isn't the same strengths. Okay. So we'll move on. Here's more of another example. This is moving to the staff model. Uh, this is a very entry level position, which I'll tell you right now, just a little plug. AM has a lot of entry level positions that we're looking for. So keep an eye on our website if you're interested. Anyway, you can see these are a lot more basic at the top required special knowledge and skills and abilities, ability to do this, knowledge of that, ability to do this. Notice it doesn't say in that area, experience with anything, evidence of anything. You get to the preferred qualifications, it talks a little more about experience and so on. But for an entry level position like this, it's really, it focuses more on, are you ready? Are you hungry? Are you eager? Um, are you a go-getter? That innovation, that innovative initiative, all that good stuff. So speak more to that when it's this basic, show that, show that to the search committee. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. You can see again, the scoring, but as I said before, now it's just on the hiring manager not necessarily a whole committee. They're just there for advisory points. The hiring manager scores are what gets submitted. And so you can see those there. Also something to think about, uh, there is the score for the uh, app applying the application process. Once you, if you're fortunate enough, once you get to the interview level, consider that a clean slate, a brand new slate. The previous scoring was to get you in the door. You're in the door, you're in the interview, all things are equal now. So don't count on anything mentioned earlier necessary to carry you through this stage. This is a brand new phase where you've got to really show what you've got, answer the questions and so on in an effective way. So I don't remember out of time, I think, or maybe that was too quick, I don't know. Uh, quick tips of re, uh, re, read uh, cap. For the application process, make sure it's the correct cover letter. Believe it or not, there have been many times people have sent in the applications and cover letters and their cover letter, they're applying to a lot of jobs and they send the wrong one. And so, you know, one of the categories is attention to detail. And so right off the bat, well, you know, this person, unfortunately, they didn't even send the correct cover letter. Uh, make sure it's the correct cover letter. Keep it to a page, page and a half. If it's more of a specialized position, there are some out there like copyright librarian. That's a little more specialized. There's maybe justification there to put more in there just to show experience and so on. The, the higher position it is, the longer your cover letter, it may justify it being. Um, specifically mention those key terms. The PD is saying, we're looking for this. Mention, mention I have this. Elaborate when appropriate. Again, get in the gate. Then look at scoring those points. Please spell check and grammar check. Um, librarians can be very fickle, right? And so a few misspelled words, 
can just set a tone. Um, highlight areas as appropriate. So again, uh, if it's faculty, maybe you want to put a little more there about your, your research um, successes. If it's not faculty, that, that may be gravy on top, but that's not what they're looking for. Focus on more of your energy, your expertise, your experience. Leadership roles, of course, speak to that. Uh, but also mention how you can work as a team as well. All those things can matter in the end. For the interview itself, time may be short. So uh, there's been several times there may be a list of eight or nine questions. Depending on the nature of the, the person being interviewed, you may only get through six of them. Well, that means you might lose out uh, if you don't get to those last two or three where they get more insights, more information on other candidates. So at the very least, make sure you you answer the questions. It's okay to ask for a question to be repeated, but hopefully it's not because you've been talking for five minutes and then say, wait, what was your question again? You know, maybe think about shutting down what was the question so you can refer to it and stay on track. Uh, have a few questions of your own ready to ask, some insightful questions. Some, a lot of times at the end of each interview stage, or maybe do you have any questions for us? It's always good to have one or two and see how they respond, see what the answers are. Nothing uncomfortable, just a general good quality questions. So think of some, have some of those in your back pocket um, and make sure your references are aware um, or ask for search committee notice before they contact them, just so you can make sure your references know, hey, you may be getting a call, you may be getting contacted, uh, be aware that that's coming. We don't want any surprises there, right? Um, okay, so again, I mentioned a quick plug. We have positions opening. Just so you know, check our website up there. It's employment at the bottom of the text CNM library's website. You can go hit employment. You'll see what positions we have available. These are just the ones right now, the ones that say librarian or librarian, the ones that aren't are, are librarian professional staff members. They are not librarians, uh, but those are all available. And frankly, we've taken a new model. A lot of times people post positions that say commensurate, salaries commensurate. We like to just say, hey, this is what it is. Uh, now there may be some negotiation in there based on what kind of experiences are there, but there you want to, there you go. You want to know what the librarian levels are. We post it. So you know what you're applying for. I'll throw in there also though, don't just look at what is being paid. Also kind of get a, <laughs> get a feel for the location and know how much it costs to live there. Uh, that can make a big difference. hundred grand probably sounds like a lot, hundred thousand dollars. That is probably sounds like a lot of money until you find out it's, in Los Angeles, and then maybe it's not that much money at all. So, so be aware, not just how much a salary is, but is that going to be enough for your lifestyle, where it's at, all that good stuff. Okay. I think I've stayed within time. I know I'm a fast talker. I'll be glad to go back over any of it. If anyone has questions, please let me know. All right, I'll go ahead and thank Derek for the great presentation. It was very helpful to see the rubric. I know when I was applying for my first library position, I did not know of any of these things that were happening in the background. So this is very helpful to see how you see the position description, how there is a rubric, and how it's very important to make sure you cover all of those things that are in the position description so you get the points. And I see there are questions in the chat but I, I saw Lely come on. So did you want to say something before we go to the questions? Uh, I just want to uh, give uh, my thanks. Uh, both presenters really uh, very impressive and very informative, especially like uh, from the point of for us, like living in developing country. This was really great. Thank you so much both for your great presentation. And I think we have many questions. I hope we can cover all. Thank you. So thank you, there baby. just can be a one hour <laughs> panel, I think. Yeah. I yeah. know that. So um, I know that some people wanted Narish to talk uh, about the interviewing part of it. But before we do that, because I think that might be a longer um, question like answer, I will get to the questions that might like have shorter answers and then we will go back to the interview part of it. So let me scroll up. I know there is a question in Q&A um, and the question is, what would you advise someone who has been teaching LIS in a different country and uh, like Africa and now in the US as a library faculty tenure track? Any losses and or gains? I don't know if someone can answer that question or if we should Sorry, ask. What, what was the question? Um... 
Uh, what would you advise someone who has been teaching LIS in a different country, like in Africa, and now in the U.S. as a library faculty tenure track? Any losses and or gains? I'm, I'm, I don't know if some, but like either Derek or Narish can answer this question. Yeah, or I think maybe no, I don't. I think um looks like the per uh, the person who asked this question is already in the U.S., right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I think um, so so if I think if you're already in the U.S., then um, then you, you have figured your way out to get into the U.S. system in in, in some ways, and uh, the losses and gains I think is more of a personal question in terms of you leaving a family behind and and working uh, over over here uh, uh, in a different place. I think uh, Lely is international. I'm international. Like so. Uh, so there, there is uh, so that sense of loss. But in terms of gains, yes, I think uh, um, there is, at least in, in my experience, I, I, I could work with world-class faculty, I think, and there was and to work into a rigorous research and teaching environment where people really care about students. And, uh, and, I, and I work with, with a very collegial set of faculty. Uh, so in fact, when I interviewed at Simmons, I told them that, uh, uh, that I find that, you know, I see myself getting old at Simmons. Uh, and I think, I still call call it one of the happiest places on earth. So I think it's it's more about uh, finding that group of people that you feel uh, comfortable working with. So I think there are gains and losses definitely uh, when you move from one country to, to the other to work. But I think there were two or three other questions which I thought were quick answer ones. Uh, there was one question uh, talking about length of the CV versus uh, a resume, and that there was advice on keeping it brief. So I would say that uh, keep both. Uh, if some people want like a one or two page uh, resume, then give them that. But you also have a longer version because especially in academic uh, uh, CVs, if every any publication listing can, can take three to four lines and all that, so it can get long. So I think the length doesn't matter in, in, in that case, uh, but it's it's good to be elaborate, uh, good to elaborate things over there. Uh, but yeah, don't put unnecessary things, things that don't, are not re really providing new information. So if there are, uh, Every word in a CV has to be thought through carefully in the sense that if there's an extra letter or extra word which doesn't really matter, then don't don't have it there. Uh, but yes, if it's necessary information, have it, but also keep a short one, one or two page version of it for specific jobs that, that need it. Also, you might need to tweak your CV a little bit based on, let's say there is a teaching, teaching emphasis uh, university. You might want to put your teaching but first, if there's a research emphasis CV, you might want to put your research past first, things like that in terms of giving them uh, what they need to see early on. Uh, um, so that was one. And I think there was another you. question. Yeah, there's another question, but probably that's uh, more uh, something that Derek can answer because I think it's about library experience. Okay. And it's yeah. uh, for career changers with no library experience, is it okay to use a resume or should we rework the resume into a CV with limited items? Uh, my my knee jerk reaction there is I would try to put it into a CV format. I mean, like like Naresh was saying, that's that's what. Well, if it's an academic library, uh, that's what that's what the that's what the language is, right? It's a CV, and so I would try to speak the language, put it into a CV, um, and like like Naresh said, you know, a CV is as long as a CV needs to be. That's where that's where you put it all, um, but. Uh, it, just to make sure there was no confusion when I was saying a page, page and a half, if that's what we're referring to, that was in reference to a cover letter. So I don't want anyone out there to think those are, those are the same thing. The cover letter is a brief little summary of what you're interested in, why you're interested in, how you're a good fit. The CV, that's that's everything, right? It's as long as it needs to be. Um, I would look at, to get back to that question, I would I would make it in the language of where you're applying. So if it's academic institution, I would put it into a CV. If it's a public library or or maybe a private institution library, maybe it could be different. I, I would still tend to put it into the CV format, though, just just for that consistency of what they're probably used to seeing as well. Yes, and um, to, just to add on to what Derek said is that sometimes people will tend to repeat things on a CV, so put the same information in different pages. So don't do that. Like have new information uh, because a person, uh, don't assume that a person is not looking through it. A person looks through your, through your CV and to be, people who don't want to see the same thing again uh, two pages later, right? So 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 that's one thing. And are we ready to go? I think there was another question. Will the recording be available? I think, Paria, that's your question. Yes, yes. Uh, so the recording will be sent to everyone after the presentation. It will be an automatic email that will go out. Yeah, also, uh, on, I have a website called narishagarwal.com. 
N A R E S H A G A R W A L. And so that's uh, that has my CV right on top, what I showed you actually. So you can, uh, I'm just putting it on in the chat as well. Uh, so that way you can, and also my research publications also listed. So if you wanted uh, a reference uh, for that, you could get it. And if you wanted advice on uh, teaching statement or research statement, you, I'm, I'm willing to work with you if you wanted like uh, help on, on that. That would be very helpful. I'm pretty sure you'll get a lot of emails. There is a question that I think both of you can answer. Um, are the positions available for international applicants as well? Which... Yes, I think that was a self-explanatory question because I am an, I was an international applicant. I had my PhD in Singapore. So I was, I was able to get a job in the U.S., but it's slightly difficult uh, in the sense that uh, the HR has to work out the visa process and, and all of it, like the work visa and all, and all that. So depending on what the immigration policy at a different point in time is, depending on the, which government is uh, over there, what kind of policies, so it can get easy or difficult. So sometimes I've seen cases where a candidate is hired, but was not eventually able to get hired because of some visa difficulties and things like that. So that could be there, but that not prevent you from interviewing and going going through the process. That happens after you are hired by the dean, and then it goes to the HR if any difficulties come out at that stage. At that stage, so do apply. I think that's that's for later to worry about. Um, the next question is for Derek, and I think it's also about the international hire. But I will read the chat the question. So they are saying that they have um, they're currently working as a librarian at the Institute of Rural Management Anand. And their area of expertise is electronic resource management. I've been applying for electronic resources librarian position since last year, but I have not been selected. I would like to know what the prospects are for international candidates working in prestigious libraries in the US. Additionally, what steps should I take and what should I be particularly mindful of to succeed in the interview process? You know, it, it's for a while, that was a difficult process because of what was mentioned earlier about the visas and issues with that and so on. That's kind of opened up and relaxed a little bit, at least here at Texas A&M. Um, one thing to be mindful of, though, whether it's because it's antiquated or because it's necessary or what have you, a lot of PDs will say uh, ALA accredited library degree, you know, from a library school that's ALA accredited or equivalent. So if your library degree is from a school that isn't ALA accredited, at least speak to that and talk about how how is it equivalent to that or it's identified or recognized in some way. Make sure and speak to that because sometimes, again, you have these different folks on search committees that, well, I don't know, the PD says ALA accredited, this doesn't say ALA accredited. Nope. You know, and so make sure you know, this is recognized as equal to an ALA accredited library, you know, or a uh, or degree. So that's one thing to maybe think about just to make sure I, I can't stress enough how so, so many times you just got to get in that door and then you could talk about what you could bring to the table, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Hopefully that's helpful. Yeah. I'm sure it was. Uh, the next question is for Narish. Um, as though they're saying, as a PhD candidate planning to complete my dissertation by spring 2025, I'm working on a three study dissertation that I anticipate will lead to a couple of journal papers. However, currently, oh my God, I lost it. I have a one co-authored journal paper and a single authored conference paper accepted. Given my relatively modest number of research publications, could you recommend strategies to strengthen my application for faculty positions this fall? And I would say that uh, yeah, when I applied for a, for my first job as well um, as an assistant professor at Simmons, and uh, so I also did not have too many publications at that point. And I think it's okay to list uh, just what you have. I think you are not really expected to have a long list of publications when you're coming in. So if you have anything... Uh, Typically, as a student, you would have posters or you'd have conference papers, one or two. You might have one or two journal papers. So I think it's okay to write uh, what you have. And then if you have things in uh, in progress, under something under revision or something even in preparation, then um, you could, I think, uh, put that in a separate document that as what I showed, like a, as an attachment to your CV saying that these are the things I'm working on along with what I have published. Or it could be part of your cover letter too. If there are only two documents to submit, then you can put that in a cover letter saying that apart from what's there on my CV, these are the things uh, which I'm working on in my research. And I think there was some question on the interview part, right, early on? Yes, yeah. I was going to say we were at, yes, if you want to talk about the interviews. Yeah, yeah I think so. The, 
the question was, let's, let's, let me go down to the question. Uh, share your insight about the interview and campus visit, et cetera. So I think, um, so Derek showed uh, and uh, a rubric that the search committee follows. So at, at Simmons, we don't typically uh, have a rubric of that sort. I think I've not seen that as part of the search committee, uh, but uh, typically you'll have a list of questions, which I've seen in different search committees is that you have questions, let's say there are three members or five members, depending on the number of members of the search committee, everybody will have the same set of questions and people will take turns saying that okay, you ask question number one, you ask question number two, and so on, so that you can do that for all the candidates all the time. And uh, one of the things to remember is that the people sitting on the other side are normal people in the sense that uh, people will sit, they will comment, uh, they might gossip, like, you know, it, it's all, uh, what what happens typically is is what you have over there. And, uh, but as a candidate, the thing which I didn't know, and I think which is nice to know, is that they, they need a candidate, they need a person as badly as you need a job. So don't think that you are the only one in a need, they are really in a need as well. So if the search fails, if they don't, uh, get the right person then the whole process has to be repeated and they they waste months of time and effort so it's really important for them to find the right person as well so don't think that you are the only one the person in need so go there as an equal so go there as something that you are there to offer and and there to provide not as not as a desperate person trying to like please take me like i'll do whatever kind of thing right so once you go that with the confident confidence that that will show when you when you show up for the for the interview and uh and depending on the different types of interviews, whether you have a day-long campus visit or you have an in-person visit, I think to show your best, uh, go with that attitude saying that uh, I'm the best of what I do. You might have a lot of other people, but this is what I offer and this is what I can bring to the table. And if you hire me, you, you will not uh, uh, go wrong. And also typically in interviews, there's the first question saying that, uh, uh, tell, tell us something about you. And when they say, tell us something about you, they do not really want to know about you. What they want to know is, why should we hire you, right? So the answer to the tell us something about your question is, why should we hire you? So you have to mold that answer in a way which, way, 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 I think that's the only answer which is kind of long. So you could go up to five minutes, but then that's where you have to really make your, your pitch as to why you are the right person in that. And do not have a lot of extra things in there, but really get to the point about, this is what I bring to the table. And uh, and this is what I, what I have. So the first question typically is uh, tell us something about yourself. Second question typically is why us? Let's say Simmons. So why Simmons? That then then why do you want to join us? Why do you think of this program? And then you have to say that you must have shown that you have done your research and you're going there for the for the right reason. Don't say I'm desperate for a job. That's why I'm, I'm applying everywhere. Like you know. So you have to say that this is this really makes sense for me and 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 that is why I'm there. And uh, then you have to talk, they'll typically talk about your experience in your current research you're doing, any, any teaching experience that you might have might have had, any experience with online teaching. Uh, and then when they ask you for questions, that what kind of questions do you have for us? Then the typical questions to ask is that, what is your uh, timeline in terms of when you do let me know? What is the tenure process? Uh, what, what kind of criteria do, do, do you use for, for tenure? Uh, what resources do you have for new faculty? What are the challenges that your university is facing right now and, and that I should be aware of? Right, so so those are the kinds. So so don't say that. Oh, I don't have questions. So typically, it's it's good to have come up with at least two or three questions uh, uh, that you go and do your research. Go through the website before you go. Any information which is there publicly available, don't ask those questions. Right. So you you should have shown that yes, I've done the research. I've I, I've read through the website in detail. You you have gone through the faculty pages, and and this is what uh, then ask. Uh, so basically, and then go for there. So uh, one uh, another tip is that before you apply for each position. I've seen that a typical application takes at least two to three hours, even if you have, uh, if you even if you're doing a blanket application. So don't just send something just to hundred different places because then they will not lead lead you to any any place. So work hard on each application. So that's important. Uh, Derek, uh, you want to add anything to to that? No, I, I like everything you said there, especially the don't ask questions that are publicly available. That's a great tip. Um, in fact, what you could really do to emphasize that is ask a question that goes past what's publicly available. Like I noticed on your website, you have blah, 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 blah. Uh, well, how do you handle blah, 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 or where do you see blah, 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 blah going? You know, and so sorry yeah. for using the the slang there, but but uh, that shows not just that you looked at their stuff, but that you have insightful questions on, well, what's the, they probably have it, answers to it. Maybe it's internal, but you know, pull that out of them or, or even things, what's really interesting is when you can ask a question to where people have different opinions as to the answer. How do you like living here? Uh, well, you know, things of that nature. What, what's the, what's your favorite thing about working here? Um, 
And then you get to really see who's going to answer and what those the variants of those answers are. Yeah. And I have two more things to add. Uh, if you do get invited to a campus visit, uh, typically there's a lunch or a dinner built in. And during the lunch or the dinner, do not think that uh, I'm not being interviewed. People are watching you at that moment as to how you talk to people. How, how, so do not, so sometimes I've, I've seen only one candidate who completely relaxed and then kind of went in a different tangent. So you, be aware that you're being interviewed all throughout. Um, so so that is one. And there's something else I was going to say, but I, uh, I forgot. Yeah, if there are anything that is specific to the position, you can always ask uh, the chair of the search committee. So let's say if there are, uh, do not say that I can, I can teach all your courses. You cannot teach all their courses, right? So... So then if you have a long list of courses, you might want to discuss with the search committee saying that which are the ones which are good to put on the application or, or, or good to put before the committee because you cannot really possibly go and teach everything. And if you touch upon the two or three most important ones, then then you, there's more greater, greater chance of success. Thank you so much, Naresh and Derek. There is a question in the chat, but I will answer it because we are all already two minutes over time. So I wanted to thank both, both of you for the great presentation. It was very helpful. And I will also hand it over to Lady to if she wants to say something and we can say goodbye to everyone. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Yes, thank you so much. This was wonderful. I learned a lot personally. Uh, these tips are very helpful. So Lady, all... sorry, one more interruption. Um, yeah, yeah. So when you go for a campus visit, it's a very difficult presentation because you are doing a, res a presentation about your research, but you're being judged for your teaching. You're being judged how you engage people when you're talking about your research. So so be aware of that. So in, in terms of how you, so do not use time, leave time for questions and things like that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much both, uh, for this great presentation. And I also thank all participants. I saw uh, we had more than uh, 50 participants uh, here. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm sure everybody uh, learned a lot. Uh, and thank you so much for our presenters and Tario. And uh, again, on behalf of SIG Triple I, uh, new professional SIG and uh, student chapters, uh, uh, um, North and Texas University student chapters, I would like to thank everybody, all presenters for this great panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck, everyone. Thank you, Rick. And thank you everyone for attending.